So I mentioned Skydeck uh, earlier um, in the introduction of this event. And as part of our partnership with Skydeck, we feature um, one of their startups at every one of these meetup events. And so I am pleased to introduce um, Sean. Is it Rezik? Um, uh, Rezik. Yeah. Rezik, thank you. No Sean worries. Rezik, who is the CEO and founder of, is it Zoba Labs? Yeah. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Welcome. And we are looking forward to hearing about Zoba. Awesome. Well, let me, uh, I will, I'll share my screen. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me. So is it working? Mm -hmm. Awesome. I feel like that's the one question that will never, you can, you will always ask whenever you share your screen, there's never going to be like a, this like feedback loop of is your screen actually being, uh, being shared. So uh, thanks, you know, thanks for everyone. Thanks uh, Bill and Amy for, uh, for having, uh, having me this, this evening, really excited to, Give everyone a little bit of insight into what we have going on here uh, at Zoba and talk a little bit more, you know, talk a little bit about how we're leveraging the cloud and actually why, uh, how the cloud has actually helped us build a business. Um, it's uh, if we kind of, I'll, I'll talk a little bit back um, how, you know, this, this area, this kind of space looked 10, 15, 20 years ago and without kind of this, you know, huge shift over to cloud in the past five or 10 years or so. Um, how, you know, our business actually wouldn't have been able to have been possible or would have taken a lot more resources and a lot of additional time to, to get there. Um, you know, as mentioned, I'm, I'm the co-founder and the current CEO of Zoba. Um, prior to this, I was actually the product manager uh, for cloud platforms at Cisco Meraki. So Meraki was an acquisition by Cisco some years ago, and Meraki was kind of on the forefront of being the first company to offer a cloud-based networking solution. So I, have, I had the fortune of working across, you know, from the infrastructure layer to the backend layer, all the way up to the actual web application layer. So, you know, for instance, we were doing about 200 petabytes of data ingested in egress um, on, a, on a monthly basis. So just this sheer amount of like, you know, a globally distributed infrastructure and cloud that I got to oversee and spend a lot of time with, which was, which was a lot of fun. Um, prior to that, I did, I was a hardware and embedded software engineer at a neuroscience startup for a bit. Uh, and then I was the product manager before I kind of jumped around between product and, and engineering for a little. Um, and I, I was product manager for a power management business uh, at Texas Instruments. So it went from basically hardware to software um, and, and software being the cloud less embedded, which uh, was more of my background. So it's been a, been a fun journey. Um, if we think of, for Zoba, for us, you know, we really set out to really want to give employees the power to discover and share ideas and information without barriers. So. A lot of the impetus for myself and my co-founders to start this business was, as I mentioned, Meraki was an acquisition by Cisco. And because of that, I had to manage four different Slack instances. I had to manage two different email inboxes. I had Box, I had uh, Dropbox, I had Google Drive. I had three different chat platforms for WebEx. I used three different task management platforms, et cetera. So as a product manager, I was consistently having to make sure information was organized, making sure information was distributed. And I just had this pain where I found most of my job was just searching for information or giving other people access to information because it was so hard to disseminate and communicate this information, even find it on my own. So if I was working with another PM or I was working with legal on specific documents or whatever it may have been, um, just this information was like so sprawled across the organization, so difficult. And then working with, you know, the bigger Cisco at the time was, was, you know, brought its own pain point. So we really together want to go out and solve and just make, you know, regardless of where this information exists in what platform, how it's organized, what the type of files are, we want to give employees the power to discover and share this information, these ideas with, without the barriers. And, you know, if we think about today is, the, the, the number of SaaS cloud applications in the, in the world is, is you know, growing, t I don't know, 10x every single day. Um, but if we look at the pure numbers, Okta did some research back in 2000. They do a, a yearly report, but Okta did a report. And they, last year, they came out with the average number of Apple cloud applications. Cloud applications itself that a company has is 88. So, and that's even at a company that has 500 employees. So if you think about companies that have 5,000 employees, like a Cisco level, 50,000 employees, they have, you know, on average, about 120. So you have this information that's again, it's siloed in Google Drive. It might be in, you know, Splunk for your, your logs. It might be in Microsoft Teams or your chat platform like Slack or Jira. So all this information is just all over the workplace and it's highly correlated in its own way. You know, you have Slack messages that are associated to a project that, you know, a project docs in Google Drive, but that information is actually not well correlated um, in the workplace unless you manually correlate that information of going to the Google doc and putting links in there to the Slack conversations. but in reality, what, what, who, who really does that? So because, you know, what we've seen is this explosion of SaaS applications within, within, the work, within the workforce, you know, just this 
information just being in silos. So we want to go out and we want to solve this problem of just the, you know, fragmented information and unorganized information in the workplace. And the initial way of, you know, what we're doing is what we're calling is kind of building this knowledge engine. So we're creating this, this um, kind of backend data infrastructure within an organization where we can, you know, basically build, we're building high correlations between data sets across different um, platforms and applications. So, you know, we can, you know, understand what Slack messages are talking about and then correlate that information to Asana tasks or Jira tasks. We can take in Google Docs and know that this Google Doc is talking about this project, this Asana test is talking about this project, then correlate that information. And we can do a lot of different applications on top of that. The, the first application that we're building on top of that is just a search bar. So how can you easily go to a single place and search across all those different cloud applications and surface relevant information much more quickly rather than having to go to, you know, three different, you know, was it in Slack? Was it in Gmail? Do I have to go to Google Drive and search through that? You can do all this through Zoba in many different mediums. Do it in the web application, in a Chrome extension, in Slack or whatever other tool that you may, may be. Zoba is becoming kind of this backend knowledge engine. And another area that we're pursuing is employee onboarding. You're a new employee at a new company or, you know, you, you just joined Berkeley and you don't know where information exists. How can we make this information more, you know, front and center for you and personalize it based off your role, your tenure, your department, all these different things so we can show this information. So there's kind of this, this application of this knowledge engine on the back end is, is, is endless, but, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're four months old, four to four or five months old, kind of depending on how you put, uh, look at it. So we're, we're really in the initial stages of a really, you know, building the, the, the initial product out. And, you know, right now we, we have that search bar available to really dive through those, those specific use cases. But it, as I kind of mentioned earlier, without the cloud, Zoba wouldn't really exist. If you look at 15 years ago, the idea of like search in the workplace isn't new, right? I, when I worked at Cisco, we had uh, in-house custom enterprise search built. And that was uh, managed by a team of 100 people, 70 engineers and 30 project managers and product managers. It was all on premise. If you wanted a new data store to be connected to it, you had to submit an application. You had to wait six months. Um, you know, Oracle has enterprise search. Um, IBM has enterprise search. But those things, those products take 12 to 18 months to implement. And no, you know, that, that's a high cost and a long time. But now because we have, you know, cloud applications in the cloud available to us, we're able to go off and you know, leverage APIs and things like OAuth and all these different ways to more easily con connect these different applications in the workplace and start you know, you know, bringing in data into our platform, building those correlations and building applications on top of it. But if we looked at 10 years ago when the cloud barely existed, you know, back in 2010 or so, you know, this would have been much harder for us to do. And we wouldn't have been able to basically accelerate and release a product in three months and allow a user to start searching within three minutes from creating an account. They would have had to wait 12 months, 18 months. So we're, we're really excited of what the cloud has actually enabled us to do. Um, but if, if I go back to my Meraki days, which was not, not too long ago, to be honest, uh, Meraki was actually an in-house custom built monolith cloud infrastructure. So back in 2007, when Meraki started, the cloud didn't really, like AWS barely existed, right? Let alone GCP and Azure. So Meraki went the route of, hey, we're going to build our own infrastructure. We're going to build and manage our own globally distributed infrastructure. So because of that, you know, we had, we maintained, we racked our own servers. We maintained all of our own servers. We, you know, we did, we did kernel upgrades. We had to do monitoring. We had to do all these things. We have a huge, infra we had a huge infrastructure team at Meraki to manage all of this. And like, there's a lot of advantage to that from a cost perspective but you know if you actually look at pure server dollars and compute costs but the amount of manpower the amount of time it took of hey we want to go out and try this new art we want to try this building this new service this new feature because of the way the architecture was built you know it, it posed its own challenges so any startup that's you know any new startup is not going to go out and build a <laughs> build their own infrastructure because that takes you know, you know, hundreds, tens of thousands, you know, 20 and tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars and a lot of institutional knowledge. Like, you know, I, I've, I've worked on infrastructure, but I couldn't tell you how to go out and like build a data center and rack some servers and all of that. So at, at um, Zova, we actually use like a relatively straightforward cloud architecture get right now. And we actually, I'll talk about this in a slide or two, but we actually went from a little bit more complex uh, architecture to a much more simple architecture. We, we kind of like over rotated and a uh, part of that was me because I was like, oh, we need to plan for 10 years in the future. So we need to build kind of this more complex architecture. But in reality, you know, we decided to just go out of the gate with Google Cloud. Um, part of this was I really like the UI. It's really easy to manage. They, they've been doing a really good job on their offerings, especially in the machine learning, the NLP space. So that's really advantageous and, and helpful for what Zoe is building. My co-founder, my CTO, did a lot of deep learning research and leveraged uh, Google Cloud for a lot of that in college, so he's pretty familiar with it. 
Um, plus, we got a free bunch of free compute credits. So why not take free money when you're a startup? Um, so it's relatively basic, straightforward. We moved over to we're using Google Compute Engine um, and then managing that with um, Google Cloud Function and then using a Cloud SQL database, just using standard uh, uh, a Postgres database um, for a lot of our backend data and housing all of that. And then we're using Firebase for authentication as well as client side configuration data. Uh, all of this is deployed via Terraform on our from a architecture and infrastructures perspective and then it ties in with github actions on our deployment for running tests deploying to our staging and development environment and end of production so you know there's five thousand ways that you can split and splice an architecture um, and this is going to develop a lot over time but when you're a company that's you know wrote their first line of code six months ago um it's this is a uh, relatively straightforward and we know that we're going to be able to scale we want to be able to scale this over time and we know it's going to change so we want to have a level of flexibility um, so some of the lessons that I've learned, uh, we've learned over the time is plan your architecture a little bit. Um, we, we sat down and we thought, what does this product potentially look like in a year, three years, five years, and 10 years? And think about how the architecture looks from that perspective. A lot of people are, are very nearsighted and say, I just need to get my first customer. And that's really important, right? We're, we, you need to get your first customer. You need to get something out there as fast as possible. Um, then there's also this balance of over-architecting it, because if you spend too much time over-architecting it, then you're never going to ship anything. So we spent a lot of time just like planning kind of what our initial architecture looked like. But funny enough, it's going to change because it did change. We, uh, I'll, I'll show you the story on the next slide, but it was a month ago, we had this like whole spiel of the reason we, we had this whole more complex architecture running cloud run with Kubernetes and all these microservices. And we're just running into so many problems on the deployment side. And that was the initial architecture that we built. And we're like, this is too hard. This is too much work for us. Let's, let's, like, let's just move over to something more simple. So be ready, like architecture can potentially change over time. Um, you can't build it faster. Um, coming from Meraki, we, we built a lot of things in-house, right? We wanted to go build up this service. We wanted to go out and you know build our own deployment service, you know build our own uh, logging service, all these different things. The beauty of running on Google Cloud, on AWS, or any of these other cloud services, they, they built it. They, 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 AWS has like, their catalog is absurdly long that you don't even really understand what it is. But if you're trying to do something, there's a 99% chance they built something. It might not be perfect, but it gets you off the ground a lot faster and allows you to learn and iterate, iterate more quickly. And then over time, you can figure out if you actually need to go out and you know, build it yourself in-house for scalability. Going around the architecture and the architectural change, build for flexibility. You, you never know, you know your, your customer might come down the road and three months and they want this particular feature and they're going to pay you a ton of money for it. Or you just, you know, the requests are coming in and you want to have some level of flexibility in the beginning to, to bring on, you know, I want to start running machine learning models on the data that we have in Postgres. So like, let's make sure it's flexible enough where we can do that. And we don't have to re-architect the whole solution to be able to grab that data and start running some, um, some models. And then what we learned is the best architecture that we thought at the time is going to cost you. Um, again, this, you know, going to the conversation before was, Hey, you have storage costs, you have compute costs. There's, there's the cloud is great, but it can get very costly, very fast. We built a really robust, we had a very simple architecture. We spent a month to build a better architecture. Our costs tripled in a month without usage going up that much. And then we're like, uh, this isn't great. <laughs> our cost has tripled for like, you know, we have like 10 users on our platform right now. So again, it's, it's always this balance of, um, you know, the best architecture in theory versus, you know, from a cost, uh, from a cost perspective. Uh, and then I'm going to close out of like, I'm not going to read through this whole thing, but this was an update uh, about a, literally almost a month ago of uh, my CTO giving his daily update about saying how we decided to, uh, we were running HTTP streaming to pull in data from the APIs from all these different services. And we needed to do that in order for speed. We, we were, we were, things were going really slow. So we're like, okay, let's do HTTP streaming. Well, Google Cloud only allowed us to do HTTP streaming on Cloud Run and the Cloud Run only, can only like run on GK on uh, uh, Kubernetes. And then Kubernetes and Google Cloud didn't actually work together too well from a deployment perspective. So we, run, we ran into this, we were running this like very complex architecture trying to build Terraform and everything around it. And the last sentence was like, let's just, let's just go to Google Cloud Engine, um, let, Compute Engine, I'm sorry. It's just gonna greatly simplify things. So we got together the next day, kind of replanned out our architecture. And then a month later, we are on this much more simple architecture. Now we can actually build features and deploy features more quickly than we can um, worrying about our architecture and our infrastructure. Um, so that was a, that was one of the biggest learnings. I remember reading this and I'm like, what did we do? What did we do here? Um, so it was a, a fun, and this, this also cost us three X, three X. I was looking, I wasn't really looking at our, our compute costs because, um, you know, we had free credits, but then I looked at our compute costs one day. I'm like, why are we spending nine X or three X? And 
uh, we dropped three X last uh, by a third last month, which is pretty exciting for us. That's uh, sorry. I talked a little bit fast. I know I had like a limited amount of time and I actually realized I had more to talk about than uh, I originally put on the slides. So um, that's, that's Zoba. And that's a little bit about the, how we thought about the, our building out our cloud architecture and how we're, how we're leveraging it. Thank you, Sean. We have a couple minutes for some questions. Well, folks are thinking, I guess I'm wondering, how do you measure success? Yeah, um, you know, right now we are, we just released our beta like, uh, you know, three to four weeks ago, um, really started hitting home on, uh, you know, we, you know, had a lot of alpha users and getting feedback from friends, family, and co I mean, not more friends and colleagues and getting that. And right now, um, as I mentioned, this, this idea of being able to access information across the organization and be able to search across it and, and grab it wherever it exists is, is quite a broad, a broad solution, a, a broad problem, right? There's, there's not a lot of argument in the place, in the workplace that, hey, information is unorganized. Like, I think that's everyone can, most people agree to that. But what our success is, is like finding out that like that one use case or that one area where um, folks feel the pain the most and we can kind of extract the most value and like, you know, build a lot of messaging and build specific features and capabilities around that. So, you know, our success is, you know, getting not like thousands of beta users, but getting beta users to just figure out where, um, you know, where the use case is, is the strongest. And one of those areas is audit and compliance as well. Um, if you think about, you know, if you had to go through a SOC audit or PCI or HIPAA or whatever it is, like the idea of like information is just everywhere. How do you, how do you provide like a simple way to discover and, and search and, and grab information across, you know, we already have like three different log services and we're six months old. Um, and, you know, in Meraki uh, and Cisco, it's like, it's, it's you know, way worse, right? So it's like these companies having to go collect information across all these other sources. It's, it's all about um, having, a, having a unified experience. So Measuring success of right now is like finding that finding that initial use case and and uh, you know being being the startup and being scrappy and working towards that. Cool. And um, we've got a question in chat. Can you speak um, about your Skydeck experience? Yeah. So you know Skydex, uh, it's been great. You know we uh, it's I, you know kudos to to Gordon and the and the rest of the team for for building like a really good experience even though we're all remote. I think. You know, the thing that we were most excited about, to be honest, was, hey, the ability to be in person and be around a lot of other founders, right? You know, work through things together, bounce ideas off of, go on to a, get into a room and whiteboard a bunch of things. Hey, I tried this, it didn't work, and, and bounce all these ideas off of one another. And in this remote world, that's a bit more difficult, right? Like it's, you're not, you're sitting in, I, I'm sitting in my living room right now by, by myself, just like most other people. And I'll give it to the, to the Skydeck team of doing a really, really good job of making sure people feel included and finding ways to help still build the relationships between the founders and the other people within the team, uh, within, within Skydeck of, of building those relationships and, and fostering those ideas. Um, so overall, you know, I give it all things considered, you know, I think, you know, COVID we can all, can all attest to it's, um, they've done a really good job. I've, I've really enjoyed my experience as far as it's kind of, you know, we, we have demo day in about a month and a half now, I, you know, timing, it's, it's kind of crazy that it's almost been six months already. It's uh, time, time has definitely flown. Um, so it's, it's been awesome. Just, it's been great to meet new people, to build, build a network, to learn a ton from people from Skydeck itself. You know, some of the co-founders, uh, I know, you know, we have, I have weekly coffee chats with some of the other founders of like, what are your problems this week? Cause we all have problems and it's, uh, it's nice to, uh, to know that you're not the only one having problems, uh, facing challenges of like, how do I get beta users? Uh, so that's been, it's been fun to, to build off of that. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Uh, maybe time for one more question if anybody has one. Hi, right. can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, please yeah, go sure. ahead. Yeah, Sean, really good uh, presentation, I loved it. Uh, I was actually interested in uh, the design process of the app. Uh, I just checked the beta website as well, just like give it a quick scan. And yeah. so far, like sort of interested in how you uh, like so the the steps that you had to take towards from like from the brainstorming session towards getting towards the beta or launching the beta so what was like this sort of the design process as far as get, like creating specifically a cloud platform like which has all its complexities and whatnot so i'm sort of interested in hearing about your perspective on it a kind of like uh, I guess design process from like an infrastructure architecture cloud architecture perspective or more of like the product yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, I would say architecture point of view as well considering the complexities that there are uh, that you have to tackle yep 
Yeah, so I'm going to give 99% uh, of the credit to my, my co-founder and CTO of, of really, um, you know, he, he's done a lot of, you know, work with, you know, Google Cloud in these different areas and, you know, machine learning and AI and, you know, name, name all those good things. And uh, we all learned kind of this, what we're calling uh, public cloud, Google Cloud, AWS together, right? We, we were all relatively new to it. I, again, I, I ran, you know, it was more of like a, I call it like a private cloud at Meraki custom built. And what we did is saying, okay, what are the what are the capabilities or the requirements that we want to support? Um, like, what is, what is kind of the core functionality that we want to support out of the gate? What does our alpha look like? What does the capability look like to the user? You know, the user is able to create an account. They're able to connect. You know, X Y Z applications. They're able to search across that in an intelligent manner. You know, this is the data that we want to collect. Um, and then, what does potentially three months look like? What does potentially six months look like? Like, what is account? What do we see potentially the the user experience and the product evolve into over time. And then we took that and really went back to like, okay, what architecture makes the most sense for us, you know, right now, because we want to get something off fast. So we, we started with Google Firebase actually, um, because it gave us authentication. It gave us a real time fire. It gave us a, a authentication, real time database. It gave us hosting all these different things out of the box. And that, you know, you can deploy a Firebase app in 10 minutes if you want. But then we noticed that over time, like when new capabilities that we wanted to build came in, we kind of had to rethink our architecture. Um, you know, the, the first piece was like, get something out as fast as possible. What's the fastest thing possible? Google, like Firebase was at the time. And then as we kind of thought about, okay, new features and new functionality based off initial user feedback and user research that we've done, then we're like, okay, now let's spend some time on the architecture and go back and look and see what that looks like. Um, so in terms of like, what's, you know, do we go with Google Compute Engine versus, you know, Kubernetes, for, you know, the Kubernetes and Cloud run all these different areas. Um, I, I can't talk into too, too much detail on it because I gave, um, I gave my CTO like free, free reign on that. Uh, my, my guidance was don't bleed our credits dry in three months <laughs> um, and, uh, and make sure we can do something in a, in a relatively quick manner. So I think like I can go in for a long discussion around like monolith versus microservices architecture because microservices is the whole rage these days and, and rightfully so. But there is some value in going a model with architecture in the beginning because you can iterate much more quickly and you can get something out much faster than if you were trying to build, build it from a microservices perspective. Um, so we were trying to figure out the best way to balance that, um, especially in the beginning. Thank you, thank you Sean. And yeah. thank you for answering these questions and a great presentation. Um, if anybody else has more questions, feel free to put them in the chat.